Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good morning everyone, and we're happy to have uh, Michael from Stanford tell us about algorithms for bipartite matching problems and some applications. Uh, thanks, you all. So uh, I will tell you about uh, algorithms for bipartite matching problems with uh, connections to streaming and uh, specification. Let me start with the motivation. Well, uh, the need to process modern massive data sets uh, imposes constraints on the types of algorithms that uh, we can use. And uh, very often, we have constraints on the space usage for the algorithm, and uh, also very often on the type of access that the algorithm can have to the data. So for example, we can no longer assume that the, we can just load the whole input into memory and have random access to it. Well, this motivates the need uh, to design succinct representations of the input that uh, approximate, uh, that preserve and perhaps approximately, the properties of the input that we care about. So for graph algorithms, uh, which is the main uh, topic of the talk, uh, cut preserving graph specification has become uh, an important way to get a succinct representation of the input and uh, has become a fundamental part of the algorithmic toolkit. So since uh, its inv invention in 96 by Benzer and Karger, it has found uh, numerous applications to undirected flow and cut problems. However, uh, the specification for directed graphs is still a challenging open problem. So this talk is centered around the following topics. So first, um, I will talk about some algorithms for bipartite matching problems that will use specification and uh, random walks in novel ways. And uh, here, we should note that uh, matchings are, in a sense, midway between undirected and directed flow. Then I will talk about uh, the question of how we can actually implement uh, cut-preserving graph specification in modern uh, data models. Then I will also talk about a new notion of specification that we have for bipartite matching problems. And if time permits, I will say some words on uh, some new connections between different notions of specification, in particular between spectral specification and spanners. Okay. So more precisely, uh, the stock will have uh, three or four parts, depending on how much time I have. I will first present some sublinear time algorithms for finding perfect matchings in bipartite regular graphs. Then uh, I, will take, uh, I will talk about a new notion of uh, specification related to matchings in the streaming model and show some applications. Uh, then I will mention some work that we did on getting a distributed streaming implementation of uh, cut specification. And uh, finally, some connections between spectral specification and uh, spanners leading to effective algorithms for spectral specification. So let me start, and uh, in the first part, uh, I would like to, ta uh, to talk about sublinear time algorithms for finding perfect matchings in regular bipartite graphs. We will get an algorithm that runs in time order n log n. So let me start with the background. So here we have a bipartite graph G. Uh, the slides of the bipartition will be denoted by P and Q. And uh, as a consequence of regularity, the, sides, uh, the sizes of P and Q are the same, which we denote by n. The number of edges is denoted by m. Recall that the graph G is deregular if uh, the degree of every vertex is equal to d. So in particular, the number of edges is just n times d. A subset of edges m is a matching if uh, no two edges in m share an endpoint. And m is a perfect matching if m is a matching and the size of m is exactly n. That is, uh, m matches all the vertices in the graph. It's easy to see uh, using Hall's theorem that uh, every deregular bipartite graph has a perfect matching. And uh, finding one such matching uh, in uh, a deregular bipartite graph is the object of our talk. These graphs have been studied extensively in the context of expanded constructions, uh, routing, scheduling, and uh, task assignment, and have several applications in combinatorial optimization. So in particular, uh, I will also show applications to two problems. The first is edge coloring of bipartite multigraphs, and uh, the second is Birkhoff von Neumann decompositions of uh, doubly stochastic matrices. Great. 
So this problem has actually seen quite a bit of algorithmic history, uh, which is close to 100 years. The first algorithm uh, can be dated back to Koenig in 1916, when Koenig gave an algorithmic proof of existence. At that time, of course, people were not thinking about uh, algorithms, but one can see that Koenig's proof runs in order mn time. In 1974, Hopcroft and Karp uh, gave their famous algorithm for finding per, uh, maximum matchings in uh, general bipartite graphs that run, runs in time order m root n. In 82, Gabov and Karev considered uh, the question constrained uh, restricted to regular graphs and obtained a very beautiful linear time algorithm for recovering imperfect matching when the degree of the graph is a power of 2. And this is a really nice algorithm in fact, it doesn't use uh, augmenting paths. Instead, it does Euler tours to decompose the graph into regular graphs of smaller degrees. Okay. Well, uh, after that, there are three improvements uh, over about 20 years. The first by Cole and Hopcroft, uh, then by Shriver, and uh, finally by Cole, Austin, Schura, who in 2000 obtained a linear time algorithm that works for general degrees. So they removed the assumption that d is a power of 2. Okay. So, well, this algorithm is extremely efficient. Uh, linear time is just the time that we need to read the input. So what else can we hope for here? And uh, the question that we ask is, uh, do we actually need to read the whole input? So can we go sublinear? For sublinear algorithms, uh, it is, of course, important uh, to fix the format in which the data is given. So for the purposes of this talk, we're assuming that the graph is given an adjacency array representation, which means that each vertex has an array of uh, incident edges. So a natural conjecture uh, would be the following. What if we take a random sample of the edges of the graph, where each edge will be present independently with a certain probability? And maybe we can prove that for certain sampling rates, the matching will be preserved, a perfect matching, will be preserved in the sample with high probability. If we could do that, we could then run some standard algorithm like hopcroft carp for general graphs and maybe get an improvement. Okay. Well, this is a reasonable conjecture. And uh, furthermore, it turns out to be true. And this is something that we proved in 09. We show that uh, it is sufficient to sample a uniform subgraph of a certain size. So the size is given by the following expression that depends on n and the degree. But the main point is that this is never bigger than n to that n root n. And uh, if we take such a sample of uh, this regular graph, then we show that the uh, a perfect matching will be preserved in the sample with high probability. Now, using hopcroft carp and uh, in the right regime for this sampling gives us an algorithm with a runtime n to 1.75. And uh, this is sublinear for dense enough graphs. So this is the result. Great. So we do have a sublinear algorithm. But uh, well, n to 1.75 doesn't really look like a natural stopping point. It seems that this should be improvable. And uh, also it seems that if uniform sampling works, then most probably non-uniform sampling can uh, help improve the, the runtime. And that is uh, also correct. We show that there is a two-stage sampling scheme. There is a uniform sampling scheme, uh, uniform sampling followed by a, a non-uniform sampling process, uh, together with a specialized analysis of the runtime of hopcroft carp on these subsampled graphs, uh, gives us a runtime which is worst case n to 1.5, and in fact equal to the, in fact is linear in the size of this uniform sample. Well. So at this point, n to 1.5 is a fairly natural uh, runtime for bipartite matching algorithms, especially given, uh, given the hopcroft carp algorithm. But then furthermore, one can see that this runtime is uh, optimal if we commit to the scheme that we're using, that is, uniform sampling first and then running uh, the hopcroft carp algorithm. However, the structure of uh, worst case examples here suggested to us that perhaps we can get an improvement if we somehow manage to combine the sampling process and the process of augmentation. So this, in fact, can be done. And uh, this is the main result of this part. 
we show you that there exists a randomized algorithm for finding a perfect matching in a deregular bipartite graph, as long as the graph is given an adjacency area representation that uh, takes order n log n time, both in expectation and with high probability. Okay. So first, yes. Well, high probability. Uh, okay. So. Stages. Yes, yes, the proof has two stages. I will show you the expectation part and hyperability will follow easily. Um, so uh, let me note the following. So first, uh, the runtime of this algorithm is uh, independent of the, degree of, the, of the degree of the graph. So basically we're independent of the size of the input. Furthermore, uh, the runtime is within a logarithmic factor of output complexity because we need uh, omega n time to just output the matching. Great. So now I will show you the algorithm, which is in fact quite simple, and uh, give the analysis. So the algorithm will use augmenting paths to repeatedly increase the, sizes, the size of the currently constructed matching. Uh, at this point, uh, let me remind you that uh, an augmenting path with respect to partial matching is a path that starts on one side of the graph, on the P side of the graph, at an unmatched vertex, and then alternates between taking unmatched and matched edges uh, until it comes to the Q side of the graph at an unmatched vertex. Well, we need a randomization of this process, and the very natural randomization is the following. Instead of taking an arbitrary step at uh, odd steps, let's take a uniformly random outgoing edge, which is unmatched, at uh, odd steps in this path, and uh, still take match matched edges at even steps. So this is something that we refer to as the alternating random walk. Let me give an example. So here we have a four regular graph and a matching of size three. So the green nodes are unmatched, the blue nodes are matched, and um, so the alternating random walk starts at a uniformly random unmatched node on the P side, a green node, takes a uniformly random outgoing edge, then takes the matched edge back and proceeds in this way. So note, for example, that uh, it can easily visit certain vertices more than once. And eventually, it arrives at an unmatched node on the Q side of the graph. Great. So it should be noted that uh, if we have a sequence of steps uh, t taken by the alternating random walk from the P to the Q side, then we can get an augmenting path from this uh, sequence of steps simply by removing loops. So here we have a loop. If we remove it, we get a length three augmenting path. And now our algorithm uh, looks as, uh, works as follows. We start with the empty matching, and uh, then repeatedly for k from, from 1 to n, uh, we run the alternating random walk with respect to the matching that we constructed so far, and wait until it hits an unmatched vertex on the q side of the graph. Then we augment using the uh, augmenting path that we get from this walk, and proceed. So, I will now show that uh, the, the, the algorithm above uh, finds a perfect matching in order n log n time. Great. So to do that, uh, it will be convenient to introduce uh, the, following, uh, the following concept. We define the matching graph, H, which depends on the graph G, and a partial matching M in the following way. So let me illustrate this. So here again we have uh, our bipartite graph and the matching M of size 3. So let me first orient all edges from P to Q. Then I will add a source and a sink. So the source is connected to unmatched vertices on the left and the edges are drawn in thick because in fact there are deep parallel edges uh, for each uh, thick edge. And the sink is connected to the nodes uh, on the right. And uh, now Let's look at the matched edges, and we'll just contract all matches, matched edges into supernodes. So this is our uh, matching graph H. Well, our algorithm can be formulated uh, in a very simple way in terms of this matching graph. So what we're doing is the following. We're starting with the empty matching, and then repeatedly uh, we run this simple random walk from the source in this match matching graph, and wait until it hits the sink. Uh, once we have uh, the sequence of steps, we augment using the path that we obtained from it. So what we need to show, right, so the main lemma in our analysis will say the following, that 
if we have our deregular bipartite graph and uh, a matching M that leaves K, two K nodes unmatched, so K nodes on each side, then the expected time until the simple random walk in the matching graph that we start from the source hits the sink is at most 1 plus n over k. So when we start with a very small matching that leaves a lot of nodes unmatched, k is large, it will be extremely easy to find an augmenting path with respect to this matching. It will get progressively harder, but the cumulative effort will be small anyway. Good. So now let me prove uh, this statement. Uh, the proof will be very simple. And uh, it will be convenient to modify the matching graph a little bit. Let's look at the nodes at the source and the sink, and let's merge them into one supernode. OK. So the process that we were running on the matching graph was the simple random walk from S to T. Now in this case, uh, this directly corresponds to st starting a random walk at this new supernode S and waiting until it gets back to S. So what we need to analyze then is uh, the expected return time uh, to this vertex S. Great. So, well, now what really helps is the fact that the graph that we're getting is a balanced directed graph. And it is most probably obvious to most of you that this will be easy to analyze. Um, and in fact, we know that for a balanced directed graph, the distribution of the simple random walk uh, can be described in a simple way. So first, let's check that it's actually balanced. So we have several types of nodes here. There is the super node. Then uh, there are these blue nodes that uh, corresponded to matching edges that we contracted. Well, they have, uh, in this case, in degree 3 and out degree 3. And in general, is d minus 1. And uh, the green nodes have uh, out degree d and uh, in degree d, because these edges are thick. So they're balanced, too. OK, good. So we have a balanced directed graph. Now, we know that the distribution of the simple random walk on uh, such a graph is proportional, is uniform over edges, and so the mass at a vertex is proportional to the vertices odd degree. Well, at the same time, what we're interested in is the return time to the special node S. But the return time is just the, the expected return time is just the inverse of the stationary distribution. And uh, now we can prove the result that we want. Now, the degree of the node S, of the super node, is d times k. Right? So k is the number of nodes that the matching left unmatched. So intuitively, when the matching is uh, small, a lot of nodes are unmatched, this random walk will spend a lot of time at S, and that's good for us. So now we can do the calculation. And uh, the cal cal calculation shows that uh, this quantity is at most 1 plus n over k. Great. So this proved the main lemma. And now it's easy to get uh, the runtime analysis because uh, we simply have n steps, and uh, each step takes expected time at most uh, 1 plus n over k. So the runtime is bounded by the summation of these quantities from 1 to n, and uh, that is exactly n times 1 plus the harmonic number of n. That's order n log n. Now, this was the expected time analysis. Uh, to get the high probability result, we, we can just apply standard techniques truncate random walks appropriately, and uh, use concentration. OK, great. So this was the order and log n algorithm for recovering one perfect matching. Now uh, let me show some applications. So the first application will be to edge coloring bipartite multigraphs. And here we get an extremely simple order m log n algorithm. Now, this is slightly slower than the best known. The best known is order m log d, where d is the degree. But our algorithm is so simple that I want to state it. Uh, so the algorithm works in two steps. The first step is standard. We take the bipartite multigraph and transform it into a bipartite regular graph. Now, in the next step, we can simply take out matchings from this uh, deregular graph that we get, one by one. Uh, each matching will take uh, n log n time uh, to find, and uh, we will be done in order m log n time in general. Now, here I'm skipping this uh, point that uh, when we run the alternating random walk, it's uh, important to be able to sample a uniformly random outgoing edge that is not matched efficiently. 
and this has to be verified, but uh, it can indeed be shown that uh, this sampling can be implemented in constant uh, amortized time here. Okay, so what seems very nice about this is that the fact that our algorithm for recovering one perfect matching is extremely efficient, takes n log n time irrespective of the size of the input, now we can find such edge colorings in a very simple manner, just by taking out matchings one by one. So another application is to finding matchings in uh, doubly stochastic matrices. And so here, if we're given m, uh, n by n doubly stochastic matrix with uh, m non-zero entries, then the Birkhoff von Neumann decomposition theorem says that uh, every such matrix can be represented as a convex combination of at most m permutation matrices. So the question is, uh, can we recover such a decomposition efficiently? Let me just sketch uh, how this works. And... Uh, hmm? Right, uh, so... B is the number of bits that, uh, that we use to represent the numbers in the matrix. Since it's a double stochastic matrix, we need to specify what kind of representation we use. So there are some known algorithms uh, that uh, find such a decomposition. And so, for example, they take order m times b time uh, to find a single matching in the support of a double stochastic matrix. And uh, they take order m b log n time to compute the whole decomposition. Now, I want to just say that uh, we have a very simple algorithm uh, with a very efficient runtime here because we can view this matrix M as a multigraph and uh, essentially the same analysis will go through. So we can run our algorithm as long as we can implement the sampling stage that is uh, sampling a uniformly random outgoing edge. This is a little harder in this case than uh, in the edge coloring case but uh, we can in fact implement this in order log n time. And uh, we get some efficient algorithms. Let me skip this, uh, this there. Great. So these were, this was the main uh, algorithm and uh, two applications. Now I want to mention some lower bounds. And uh, we proved two, uh, two statements here. So first, we proved that randomization was crucial to obtaining sublinear time algorithms. In particular, any deterministic algorithm has to take at least linear time. So the algorithm of Cole, Austin, Schurer, which found a matching in linear time on the size of the input, was essentially optimal. Uh, furthermore, we show that we cannot improve upon, one cannot improve upon the n log n runtime if we want an algorithm that uh, works with high probability. So essentially, what this shows is that while we cannot rule out the existence of an algorithm that uh, finds a matching in order n expected time and terminates with probability one half, let's say, but if we want an algorithm that uh, terminates with high probability, then it has to take uh, at least n log n time in the worst case. Great. So uh, this uh, completes the first part of the talk. Mm. So I talked about sublinear time algorithms for finding regular matchings in bipartite graphs, and some of them use sparsification, at least the first, the first ones of them. So now I want to spend uh, a few minutes mentioning a, a different project uh, that we worked on, and uh, this is about graph sparsification and how we can implement graph sparsification in uh, modern data, modern data arch architectures, in particular in active DHTs. I will define what that is in a few minutes. So, uh, even though we used cut sparsification in the first part to obtain the first two sublinear time algorithms, I didn't define it, so let me define it now. So, if we have a graph G, an un uh, a weighted undirected graph G, then a subgraph H uh, is a cut sparsifier, an epsilon cut sparsifier of G, if all cuts in H are within a 1 plus minus epsilon factor of the corresponding cuts in G. So this is a great concept because if H is sparse, then we can use H uh, instead of G in uh, cut or in cut-based optimization problems, getting better runtimes. Uh, the famous theorem of Benzer and Karger, proved in '96, shows how to construct uh, such sparsifiers. In particular, they show that one can calculate 
probabilities. For each edge, one can calculate a probability p, such that if edges of the graph are sampled with these probabilities, and then we weight the sampled edges uh, appropriately, the resulting weighted graph H will be a sparsifier of G with high probability. Furthermore, Benzer and Karger also gave a nearly linear time algorithm for finding these weights and uh, hence constructing the sparsifier. Well, since 96, uh, this has found numerous applications in uh, cut and flow problems and in fact has become an integral part of the algorithmic toolkit, arguably alongside such fundamental primitives as uh, BFS and DFS. So this motivates the need to obtain efficient implementations of cut sparsification in modern data models. So the question that we ask here is, can one get an efficient implementation of cut sparsification in a distributed streaming setting? So ideally, oh, we want an algorithm that works in a single pass in a distributed streaming setting. To put this in perspective, one might think of uh, the situation where the nodes of the graph do not fit into the memory of one compute node. And uh, our architecture for this will be active DHT, which I will define uh, in a few moments. It should be noted that efficient implementation, implementations are known for random access model and one pass streaming model. But we also want to be efficient in the distributed setting. Okay. So let me say a few words about what active DHTs are. But before I do that, I need to remind you what MapReduce is. So MapReduce is this immensely successful uh, paradigm that uh, transformed uh, offline analytics and, data and uh, bulk data processing recently. In MapReduce, data is stored as key value pairs uh, in a distributed file system. And uh, computations are a sequence of iterations of certain MapReduce steps. So mappers and reducers are essentially processes that uh, are essentially compute nodes and there is a programming paradigm that uh, specifies how they interact. Well, the main point here is MapReduce is great for offline data processing. So active DHTs, on the other hand, uh, may potentially become as important for online data processing as uh, MapReduce is for, uh, for the offline problem. And active DHT here, in fact, stands for Active Distributed Hash Table, and uh, the hash table is active in the sense that, uh, besides uh, supporting lookups, deletions, and insertions, it also supports uh, running arbitrary functions on key value pairs. There are some examples of such systems implemented. Uh, for example, Twitter's Storm system and uh, Yahoo's S4. And the main applications are distributed stream processing and uh, continuous MapReduce. So one might think of this as MapReduce, where the mappers and reducers do not interact according to this rigid paradigm in iterations, but they have the ability to talk to each other continuously. These are fairly new systems, and in fact there are challenges in implementing them which have not yet been fully solved, such as uh, the inefficiency of small network requests and uh, robustness, but people are working on that. Okay, so that's all, I will, all that I will say about active DHTs. Now, what we're interested in here is constructing a sparsifier on uh, active DHTs. So let me sketch how this, uh, this will work. And uh, to do that, first uh, I would uh, like to look at how standard efficient algorithms for constructing sparsifiers work. In general, there are two steps. First, one needs to find these probabilities PE, uh, the sampling probabilities, and once we have the probabilities, we can just sample independently uh, using these uh, rates and weight edges appropriately. So the, the most important step here is, of course, how do we find the probabilities? And uh, at a high level, the observation that we use is that uh, one can estimate these sampling probabilities using a hierarchy of uh, union-find uh, data structures. The benefit of this will be that union find will be fairly easy to distribute. Of course, there are some challenges that we need to overcome uh, to make this work. Um, one of those is the fact that we need to estimate uh, connectivities and uh, sample at the same time. We have to control the size of the sampling when, uh, when this happens, but this can be done. And uh, another interesting point is that we have to when we distribute the union-find data structure, 
we have to ensure two things. First, that the, our distributed implementation does not lead to excessive communication. And furthermore, we need to, dis to ensure some load balancing properties. That is, that not only do we have small communication, but also that the communication is somewhat evenly spread across computes, compute nodes. Okay. Well, uh, these are some challenges that uh, we can overcome. And uh, let me just state what we're getting. So we get uh, an efficient uh, distributed stream processing algorithm that computes a sparsifier on active DHTs in one pass. And it has some uh, favorable space usage properties and uh, good communication and load balancing. So I have to skip most of the details here, but I'm happy to chat offline if, uh, if somebody is interested. OK. Great. OK. So, so now I just, so, so far I've been talking about sublinear algorithms for matchings and, uh, cut, uh, and uh, cut specification. Now, in the remaining time, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, a new notion of specification that is related to bipartite matching problems that we recently introduced and uh, show some applications to approximating matchings in one pass in the streaming model. Okay, so let me now introduce this definition. Suppose that we have a bipartite graph, G. Uh, the sides of the bipartition are P and Q. And uh, for simplicity, we will assume that the sides are equal. So the size of P is the size of Q, equal to N. Now, we call a subgraph H an epsilon cover of G if uh, H preserves sizes of matchings between any pair of subsets, A and P and B and Q, up to an epsilon N additive error. So here is an example. Suppose that uh, we have uh, the graph G here. So this is the P side, this is the Q side. And uh, the condition that H is an epsilon cover says that whichever two pairs of sets A and B will look at, and we compute the maximum matching between the two in G, and then we compare it to the maximum matching in H, the maximum matching in H should only be at most an epsilon n uh, additive term smaller. So, of course, the main question that we're interested in here is uh, what is the optimal size of uh, an epsilon cover for a graph on two n nodes, n nodes on each side? So, this question asks for a general trade-off. We're given n and we're given epsilon. Well, what is the size, the optimal size of a cover? Now, we'll also be interested in the following twist of this question. Suppose that I want an efficient cover. I want to represent the matchings in graph using few edges. So I constrain my cover to have O tilde n edges. And uh, so n poly log n edges. And this is a standard notion of small, let's say for streaming algorithms. Now the question becomes, what is the smallest epsilon for which an epsilon cover with few edges, that is O tilde n, always exists? So these are the two questions that we're interested in. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, there is no prior work on this, so I will just go to our results. And uh, here we prove the following. So on the positive side, we prove that uh, we give an efficient construction of a one-half cover of a graph G that uh, has a linear number of edges. Furthermore, we show that this is in fact tight, in the sense that if we constrain the size of the cover to have O tilde n edges, n polylog for any polylog, we cannot, do, uh, we cannot have a cover for epsilon smaller than one half. If we want an epsilon cover for epsilon smaller than one half, then for some graphs, it will need to have at least n to the power one plus omega of one over log log n edges, which is significantly bigger than uh, any n poly log n. Okay, so this essentially completely characterizes the second question that we asked about uh, what is the best approximation that we can get with a uh, few edges. And uh, for the general case, for the general trade-off, we show that uh, the optimal size of an epsilon cover is essentially equal to the largest possible number of edges in a so-called epsilon Ruscha's Emirati graph. So this is a very interesting family of graphs that come up in uh, PCP constructions, uh, property testing, and additive combinatorics. And I will say a few words about them at the, at the very end. Okay. Great, so these are the results, but uh, the question, now the natural question is, how good is it? So what does it mean that we have a one-half cover? So 
to put this in perspective, let me remind you what our main motivation is. So the main motivation is finding approximating matchings in the streaming model. So here, uh, we, the edges of a graph are given to us in an arbitrary order in a stream. And uh, we can only use O tilde n memory. The question here is, what is the best approximation factor to the maximum matching in the graph that we're given can we obtain in a single pass over the data? Okay. And, uh, oh, sorry. Great, so in the context of this, uh, one might think that a one-half cover may not be useful because a half seems like, it's, it seems that the half is this half approximation that we can always get by just keeping a maximal matching. That is in fact not correct, and we show that the one half for cover, one half for covers, in fact, roughly corresponds to an approximation factor of two thirds for matching, for matchings. So here are our results um, related to streaming. The techniques that we use to, const to construct our half cover yield us the following. First, uh, we get a two thirds approximation to the natural communication problem associated with matchings in one pass, and I will define that in a few slides. Uh, furthermore, we get a lower bound of two-thirds for one-pass streaming algorithms. That is, we show that no one-pass streaming algorithm that uses O tilde n space can get a better than two-thirds approximation to maximum matchings. And finally, this will also be useful in the... Which, so this was for the communication problem and got a lower bound. But we will also show that our techniques are useful in the streaming, in the general streaming case, as long as we make this additional assumption that uh, we don't have edge arrivals, but vert vertices arrive in the stream. I'll talk about this a little later. Great. So, in the remaining time, I will do the following. First, uh, I will show the construction of uh, what we call the matching skeleton. So, this is the matching sparsifier uh, that is our main tool for these results, and we show that uh, it is a half cover. I will have to skip the proof, however. And then I will talk a bit more about the applications to streaming and uh, also the connection between epsilon covers and uh, Rusha's Emirati graphs. Okay. So, the matching skeleton. Mm, so, the matching skeleton will be a sparse subgraph of G uh, that, uh, in a sense, preserves some uh, useful information about matchings. And now I will give the construction. But first, I will make this uh, one technical assumption that in our graph G, there is a perfect matching of the P side. The general construction will be very similar, but th this will be easier to describe. So what this says in particular is that the vertex expansion of uh, all sets on the P side is at least one. So one other thing that I will need is uh, the definition of an alpha matching. So this is a fractional matching uh, that matches each vertex on the P side exactly alpha times and each vertex in Q at most once. So alpha will be bigger than one. Great. So the construction of this matching skeleton uh, will proceed in two steps. Uh, first, I will take the graph and uh, come up with the decomposition of the vertex set of the graph into what we call expanding pairs. So these will be pairs uh, as JTJ. And uh, these will be vertex-induced subgraphs that have increasing vertex expansion. So the j uh, such subgraph will have expansion denoted by alpha j, and this expansion will be the ratio of the size of the graph. Okay, so once I have this decomposition, I will choose a fractional matching inside each uh, such subgraph, and so the edges that the fractional matching is supported on will be the edges of the skeleton. Okay, so how does the decomposition work? Uh, the, decomposi the decomposition works as follows. We start with a graph, and we repeatedly find and remove sets S from the P side of the graph that uh, have the smallest vertex expansion. So for example, here we find the set S0 that has the minimum possible vertex expansion, and we remove it from the graph. Now, it might seem ill-defined, and in fact it is, as I just stated it, because there could be a lot of such sets that have the smallest possible vertex expansion, but one can show that there will always be a maximal such set to remove, and that's what we do. So this gets removed from the graph, and we recurse on the rest. Now, again, we find the smallest expanding uh, set in the P side, 
and we remove it. Great. So this goes on uh, until the remaining part of the graph has essentially the best possible expansion for such a graph, that is expansion equal to the ratio of, uh, the, of the sides of the bipartition. Okay. So this is the decomposition. Now, it can be shown, in fact, that the vertex expansion goes up as we do this, uh, do this process, and uh, each piece in the decomposition has a vertex expansion, which is the ratio of uh, the sizes of the, size, uh, the sets in the bipartition. So in particular, there exists a fractional alpha j matching, where alpha j is this expansion, uh, in each such subgraph. This matching can always be chosen to be a forest, just by canceling cycles. And uh, the edges that this forest, the edges of this forest, are exactly the edges of our matching skeleton. Great. So this is the construction. Now I have to skip the proof of the main property, but the main property is the following. Suppose that we have two graphs, bipartite, uh, G1 and G2, and uh, we're interested in the maximum matching in the union of, of these two graphs. Now, if we instead replace the first graph with its sparsifier, with the matching skeleton, then what we get is a two-thirds approximation. So this is the main property, and uh, one can in fact derived from this property that the matching skeleton is a half cover. So what this means is that we have a graph with n vertices on each side, then the matching skeleton of this graph will preserve the sizes of matchings between any pair of subsets up to an additive n over 2 term. Okay. Well, again, let me stress that it might seem that uh, something simple like a maximum matching would uh, have these properties, but in fact that is not true. A maximum matching uh, does not give a better than two-thirds cover. Okay. Fine. So now, uh, let me sketch the connections to streaming. And uh, so, so, so far I defined this matching skeleton and uh, showed that this is a half cover. Now, let me show the connections to streaming. And here, I need to define the following communication problem. Can you repeat the definition of an epsilon cover? Oh, sure. Um, I have to use that. So, if we have a graph, G, then the graph H is an epsilon cover, uh, so, and uh, it's balanced in the sense that there are n vertices on each side. Now, H is an epsilon cover if the following is true. If we look at any pair of set sets, A on one side and B on the other side, and calculate the maximum matching between these sets in G and in H, and we compare them. Now, the maximum ma matching in H should only be an at most an epsilon n additive um, term smaller. Yeah. So in this case, so here we get uh, this property with uh, one half, so we preserve these matchings up to an over two additive term. <clears throat> okay, so the communication problem is the following. Um, we have two communicating parties, Alice and Bob. Now Alice has a graph G1, and Bob has a graph G2 on the same set of vertices, but uh, with a different set of edges. Now Alice sends a message to Bob, after which Bob is supposed to output a 1 minus epsilon approximation to the maximum matching in the union of two graphs. So maybe this matching. Okay. Now, the questions that we're interested in here sound a lot like the ones that we asked for matching covers. First, what is the minimum size of the message that Alice needs to send Bob that will always let Bob output a 1 minus epsilon approximate uh, matching in the union? Now, this is, again, asking for a general trade-off between n and epsilon. And uh, a, constraint, a restricted version of the question is, suppose we restrict the communication between Alice and Bob to be uh, O tilde n, so n polylog n, quasi-linear, in, in the number of vertices in Alice's graph. What is the best approximation that they can achieve? Well, a natural approach to this problem is to just ask Alice to send a maximal matching of her graph to Bob. This will be very little communication, it will take O tilde n communication, and give a one-half approximation. So now, um, yeah, well, this is a great problem, but why, why, do we, why do we care about this problem? Now, the motivation for this problem comes from the problem of approximating maximum matchings in one pass in the streaming setting. And in fact, a lower bound for the communication problem will immediately translate into a lower bound for streaming algorithms. And uh, well, an upper bound will not really translate directly into anything, 
but nevertheless, uh, the, the techniques that will work for, for the communication problem will also let us get a result for streaming with vertex arrivals. Okay. So there, there is some prior work on this problem. Mm, there has been significant pro progress on approximating matchings in the streaming model in k passes, but for k greater than, greater than 1. For a single pass, the best known approximation is still one half, and achieved by the trivial algorithm that just keeps a maximal matching. This was very recently improved to one half plus epsilon for a small positive constant epsilon, but this is under an additional assumption that the edges arrive in a random order in the stream. And uh, we're interested in the case when the arrival order is uh, adversarial. Uh, this is uh, Conrad, uh, Manier, and Matthew. Very recent, maybe a month or two ago. Um, so, yeah, so on the lower bound side, the only lower bound known is omega n squared for one pass, but this is for computing exact matchings. Okay, so, so let me state our results. So first, it uh, follows immediately using the results that we proved for the matching skeleton that the communication complexity of obtaining a two-thirds approximation to maximum matching is uh, O tilde n. In particular, instead of sending a maximal matching of her graph, Ellis can compute the matching skeleton, which is sparse, and send it to Bob. And uh, so this is for the communication problem, but uh, for the general streaming case, we show that, in fact, so if we use this sparsification procedure given by the matching skeleton, we can just use it repeatedly in the streaming model. And as long as we have the assumption that not edges but vertices arrive in the stream, we will get a 1 minus 1 over E approximation to the maximum matching. This will take linear space, uh, and we will only use a single pass over the data. So it should be noted here that 1 minus 1 over E can also be obtained in this setting, using the KVV algorithm for the online version of the problem. But uh, that algorithm is uh, randomized, and uh, so our algorithm will be deterministic. Okay. So, uh, so far, I showed that uh, one half covers exist, and that uh, communication complexity is quasi-linear when we want a two-thirds approximation. But a natural question is, uh, what about uh, better covers and uh, better better approximation. Well, uh, here we show connections to a family of graphs uh, known as epsilon Ruches and Reddy graphs. Unfortunately, I do not have enough time to define them properly, but essentially uh, what uh, these graphs are defined by the property that they, their edge set can be partitioned into a union of induced matchings and each such induced matching will have size at least epsilon n. Uh, in fact, these graphs come up in applications in property testing and in PCP constructions and additive combinatorics, and it is a major open problem to determine the optimal size of uh, these graphs as a function of epsilon and n. Uh, the gaps between the best known bounds are immense. So for example, the best known upper bound for these graphs is n squared over log star, and uh, the best-known constructions for constant epsilon achieve uh, this, uh, the number of edges, which is n to 1 plus uh, omega of 1 over log log n. Okay. So, and we show that for the general question of uh, bounding the optimal size of epsilon covers, this question is essentially equivalent to bounding the optimal size of epsilon Ruches and Meredi graphs. Okay. Um, Okay. Now, furthermore, let me say how we obtain the lower bounds for streaming algorithms and lower bounds for the communication complexity problem. Uh, and uh, so this is done via an extension of a beautiful result by Fisher and uh, others, where they construct epsilon Ruches and Reddy graphs that uh, have uh, constant epsilon. And they achieve uh, the number of edges n to 1 plus omega of 1 over log log n. But their construction works for constant epsilon, and uh, here we extend this construction to work for all epsilon arbitrarily close to one half. Now, this immediately gives us lower bounds uh, that say that our bounds on the half covers and uh, linear communication complexity are best possible. That is, 
if we insist on quasi-linear communication, two-thirds is the best we can do. And if we insist on quasi-linear number of edges, one-half is the best we can do for covers. So this also implies a streaming bound. And so this one-half here is actually the largest epsilon that we can possibly uh, hope for, because our construction of a one-half cover precludes the existence of uh, these graphs with a large number of edges for larger epsilon. Okay. Great. So, so this concludes the discussion of uh, our notion of specification for matching problems and uh, applications to streaming. Now, in the remaining minute, uh, let me say two words about uh, some other work that we have been doing with uh, Rina Panigrahi. And uh, so this is... Uh, this <laughs> so this is just a... Uh, this shows some connections between spectral specification and spanners. And uh, in fact, we show that uh, one can obtain efficient algorithms for uh, obtaining spectral sparsifiers using spanners of random subgraphs. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I've done some other work on uh, online matching and uh, multi unbended problems and uh, differentially private uh, low rank approximation. And I thank you for your attention. This algorithm definitely takes time and log in on the complete graph. So, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I, I don't know of any assumptions that would uh, make it actually order n. No, that, that's a good question. No. Yeah. And the lower bound, actually, the lower bound that we prove, in fact, precludes order n with high probability only for dense graphs. That is, if we have n squared, uh, close to n squared edges, omega n squared. So the, uh, if the graphs are sparser, it's not clear. And in fact, it cannot be true for very sparse graphs because there is a linear algorithm if the, the degree is constant. Yeah. Right. the degree the same root There's yeah, nothing that I'm aware of. It's interesting.